Did you know that planet Earth has its own built-in heating and air conditioning system? Yeah, that's right. Now you may not have seen an enormous version of one of these things hanging out on the Earth, but the Earth does have this amazing system that helps to regulate the temperature, keeping the really hot areas from getting unbearably hot and the really cold areas from getting too cold. So, what is this system and where is it and how does it work? Well, hang out with me for a few minutes and we're going to find out the mystery of Earth's heating and cooling system. Now, to help us identify where this system is located on planet Earth, we've got three great characters along with us today. We've got Squirt, Crush, and Nemo's dad. If you've seen the great movie Finding Nemo, you'll remember the scene where these three characters are zipping along on an underwater river known as the East Australian Current. And it's the movement of water and the energy in the water of these ocean currents that is truly the heartbeat of Earth's heating and cooling system. Now let's remember why this system is so critical. Without a cooling system, the direct rays of sunlight at the equator would lead it to be blazing hot. Okay, maybe not literally burning, but too hot to live. And meanwhile, without a warming system, the indirect rays of light at the poles would lead it to get cold, super cold. Think mini ice age spreading from the North and South Pole. Meanwhile, people and animals are squished into a small livable zone between the extremes. Not so good. And this brings us back to those ocean currents. But a really good question comes to mind right now. How is it that these currents can flow in the ocean? After all, isn't the ocean mostly flat? Don't you need to have like hills and stuff in order to get a river to flow? Well, that's a great question. And in order to understand how currents can flow in the ocean, you've got to understand convection. And rather than just talking about convection, you're going to get to watch me actually make a real-life convection current that operates on the same principles that make the water in the oceans move. So let's go ahead and set this up. The left and the right-hand sides of the fish tank will represent the oceans near the north and south pole. The middle of the fish tank, above where that rock is, will represent the equator. So now that we've got the water in the ocean, how do we get convection to occur? Well, in order for convection to happen, you must have differences in density within the fluid. And there's two main ways that the density will change in ocean water. The first way is when there's changes in temperature, and the second way is when there are changes in salinity. Now, salinity is just the amount of dissolved chemicals in a fluid. In the ocean, we're mostly talking about the salt. And as the salt is dissolved into the water, the water becomes more dense and sinks. Now you might be wondering, why is the water at the pole saltier than in other places? Well, it's because of an interesting thing that happens when water freezes. As water freezes, most of the salt is left behind in the water beneath the ice. And so the water at the poles becomes more and more salty as the water freezes. Now that I've got the salinity adjusted in the tank, the next step is temperature. I'll use ice to get the water near the poles really nice and cold, and I'll use a rock that I've boiled in a pot to get the water in the middle of the tank, representing the equator, nice and warm. Now, of course, there's a little bit of a problem with my model. In the real world, the ocean isn't heated from the bottom up. It's heated from the top by the sun. But my rock will accomplish the same thing of getting the water near the equator in our model to warm up. So at the poles, our high salinity cold water becomes very dense. 
Its molecules are closely packed together, and in a fluid, dense things tend to fall. So the cold water falls to the bottom of the ocean and moves towards the equator. Meanwhile, the less dense, warmer water travels from the equator towards the poles to take its place. It's this beautiful circle that warms the poles and cools the equator. Think I'm just making all this up? Well, watch what happens when I add a little food coloring to the tank. Now you may have noticed that my fish tank model is a little bit simpler than the actual planet Earth, where, as you can see in this great animation by NASA, the ocean currents are deflected, they must travel around the continents. But the big idea is the same. Deep water formation happens where salty cold water sinks and gradually makes its way back towards the equator, where eventually it's warmed and it rises and it travels along those surface currents, which are influenced by things like the push of the global winds. It can take a thousand years for a drop of water to travel the path of this current, also known as the Great Conveyor Belt or the Thermohaline Current which brings energy and matter all around our globe. So there you have it, Earth's very own heating and cooling system, an all-natural arrangement that keeps our planet in balance. Have a great day. Keep cool, or maybe warm, and as always, stay curious, my friends. Now I got kind of curious about this idea of water losing its salt when it freezes. So I did a little experiment. I took some water and I mixed in a bunch of salt and then stirred it until it dissolved. Then I went ahead and put it in my freezer and let it sit for a while, but not too long. Just long enough for the top to turn into ice. I took this ice out of the cup and after I rinsed it, I tasted it. And guess what? It wasn't too bad. A little salty, but not terrible. Then I went ahead and took a sip of the unfrozen water beneath it. Oh my goodness, it was horrible. So salty, super high salinity. So I guess my own experiment shows, yeah, this thing really works. The water beneath the frozen poles will become more and more salty as more water freezes. Pretty cool. You should try this one out yourself.